Hi, everybody. We are back, and we are joined by Michael Edwards and Brad Carson, Carlson from Novartis, and they're going to share a little case study with us about a project that they were working on defines customer experience in almost all aspects of its concept and execution from beginning to end. So please, I will give the floor to Brad and Mike, and we will give them a virtual uh, non-audible applause as they talk to us about Generation S. Take it away, fellas. Thank you, guys. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure on behalf of Brad and myself. Uh, we will be uh, going back and forth so you hear from both of us, uh, but just super excited to share with you something that we think is very different from a pharmaceutical standpoint, but also from a customer standpoint and, and really puts patients at the very center. Um, what you'll see here is Generation S, and this was a disease, uh, or is, I should say, a disease state awareness campaign that was launched in September of 2018. So, you know, having been in the pharma industry for 20 plus years now, um, in a variety of different roles, I will say coming to uh, Novartis three years ago, this was a unique opportunity. And I think you'll see from the presentation that Brad and I share with you today, that this, this is a, a, a very different area. One, um, what you'll see here is certainly representative of the community and every single face that you see here is an actual member of Generation S. And we'll talk about why that's so significant and so important, uh, but really speaks to the authenticity. And you're gonna hear that word quite a bit from us today, but we really feel like this, this uh, work, uh, first of all, was meaningful, uh, but certainly is very different than what you might expect from a traditional pharmaceutical campaign. We'll go to the next slide, please. So let's just, whoops, can we go back one? Thanks, Brad. So if you guys um, could just, just, you know, just so we level set, sickle cell disease is a condition, a genetic condition that's been around and, and discovered since 1910. So if you think about that, that's 111 years ago, and it disproportionately affects people of color. So that means um, in the US, those that are African-American, Caribbean-American, African, uh, who have migrated, East Indian, um, biracial, uh, Hispanic, um, and all other sorts of ethnicities where the, the, the bloodline is, is potentially placed back to Black origin, this uh, population is disproportionately affected with this condition. And there's been a a stigma associated with the lack of information around sickle cell. More than 100,000 people have sickle cell here in the US and millions around the world suffer from this condition. There's really been no um, heavy emphasis or funding or studies or anything until recent years. So what you've had is a group of people who have been marginalized, um, mistreated by the healthcare system because there really has not been anything to address this condition. and um, treated essentially um, in, in a very disparaging way. Um, so there's a certainly a, a, a huge opportunity. And that was the opportunity that we saw with Generation S, an opportunity to bring sickle cell to the forefront and really be able to do something to cast a light on the hundreds, 100,000 plus people in the US that were uh, affected by and suffering with this condition. And really the public having no real idea of what was going on. So if you look here, what Generation S is, is it is a co-creation with the sickle cell community. Uh, so patients, advocates, uh, caregivers, loved ones, and even HCPs, quite honestly, authentically connecting and making a difference. So you'll see this is a truly a consumer launch. Again, you'll see faces here that represent members of Generation S, people that literally signed up and got behind what we were trying to do. But I really want to point out that experience driven and you'll see a young man there with his sleeve up. That's the Generation S logo. It's the first time in my career that I've ever been responsible for any program that literally uh, touched patients so much that they went out and put a tattoo, a permanent tattoo on their arm relative to the impact that Generation S has done to create meaning in their lives. So 
with that, you know, we really wanted to take pride in being a partner with this community. And I think, uh, you know, Brad is in a perfect situation to tell you what the results were. <clears throat> Great. So uh, thanks, Mike. That was a good, uh, good intro. So I was uh, Mike's digital partner. So Mike was the, the brains behind this on the marketing team. And as his digital partner, we worked very closely uh, together on this. And you know, we did see um, you know some some great numbers from this campaign. But I think you know, if, if you're listening to Mike and really reading between the lines, this wasn't about numbers or you know what could we do to to position ourselves in sickle cell disease. It was really about the community. These patients were underserved and really need support, and that was uh, I think what drove it. This passion from Mike and his team to really improve the lives of these patients is what drove um, you know such great innovation here. But we did end up with twenty two thousand. Um, you know, members of the community. We did get actually 1,103 stories to be exact. And we had a Facebook community with about 31,000 followers. And then we always like to throw at the end that one tattoo, because I think that that one tattoo says more than any of those other numbers, right? That that we had that impact on patients. And, um, you know, this allowed us to, to, to build this website that was not, it, it wasn't stock photography, it wasn't models, it was literally patients. And we had 150 stories that built this website that came in from the community. We had geo-targeted uh, promotion around it. We went to areas that, you know, where it had a high prevalence of sickle cell disease, did local media. Michael talk a little bit about some of that, what was done in the local um, events, uh, you know, in a moment. But really, we, we used the what we knew about these patients. We had third-party data. We did a lot of research on where do these patients, you know, go online, not just for information, but where can we find them to, to get them activated, to, to take action if they're not actively seeking it, like in a lot of other conditions. One of the things we did is we, we had about 100 stories come in. We did a... Um, we did a uh, language analysis and we noticed that there was a lot of stories talking about faith, church, God, prayer. And we said, you know, could we, could we you know, reach them that way? And we did. We partnered with the Nas National Black Church Initiative to, to find patients that way. And that was really just a lot of what we did was how can we connect with this community in ways that, as Mike said, authentic, you know, real and, and get in there. We built a documentary series with these stories not patients that we found that were good in front of the camera, but really had a great story to tell and had already you know, shared that story with us. We just took it a step further. And um, I'll let Mike talk about some of the other stuff that, that was done around this. Awesome. So, you know, as, as Brad mentioned, we really were buried on with insights, right? These stories that people trusted us as part of submission for joining Generation S, and they had options to either share a story or simply to join. And as you heard Brad say, we had more than 1,100 stories. So when you have 1,100 unique stories all talking about, first, first of all, for the first time in their lives, having a platform that they can share with their family, their friends, and ultimately the world, we really wanted to, to kind of value each one of those stories and provide a way to showcase as many of these stories as we possibly could. So we took our website, which had all sorts of limitations, and with Brad's help and his team, we literally blew up every single internal limitation we had and built a custom website that was able to not only showcase what we call a mosaic, if you will, um, it, it showcased uh, a, a, a dynamic 150 story plus uh, at any given time mosaic that we moved in and, and, and enhanced over time to add more stories. But what you see here is that people could go onto our website and click a face, uh, a face that might maybe reminded them of themselves and hear more about that person. If I was completely ignorant to sickle cell, I could go here and learn about what these people were dealing with, what they were experiencing on a daily basis. And some of these videos were by patients, their caregivers. We had some by HCPs. Um, and those that were also just supportive of what we were trying to do. So just a, tr a phenomenal way to bring sickle cell to life for anyone with a mobile device or a laptop anywhere across the U.S. And we'll talk about how we also brought that to life in person. So perfect segue. Brad mentioned that we had live events. So within the sickle cell community, there were several live events and lots of different organizations who all touch regional pockets of the country. And what we decided was, how do we take something digital and bring it to life? It's one thing to have a computer screen, but you can't feel that. So what we did was we built a custom, actually it's two custom, what we call story labs. And we built them on site and we incorporated technology via iPads 
that allowed us to not only have people come into this almost like, like almost like a photo booth, but bigger, where they would be able to come in, sit in front of this iPad, do a short enrollment, and then leave their story right there on the spot. So this was awesome because it allowed us to capture them in the moment. There were people that did it in groups. There were people that did it with their parents, their friends, their, their community members. It was really awesome to, to see a variety of different emotions, um, all sorts of insights that were just generated by people allowing uh, themselves to kind of step out of their comfort zone and really share some inspirational stories with us. So I also will kind of show you another way of how do we bring science? How do we bring uh, what people may not understand into a way that people can experience it? And what we did was within sickle cell, sickle cell essentially happens uh, by your blood vessels and your, well, your blood cells and your blood vessels becoming very sticky. And as those sticky cells kind of clump together, they create what's called pain crises. And pain crises are when essentially oxygen in your veins or your arteries are not able to, to, to transfer this oxygen, if you will. And that what happens is there's an enormous amount of pain that happens that lasts days and sometimes weeks, uh, unbearable pain. Um, and what we wanted to be able to do was have a way to, for us to have patients articulate, or just say, to articulate that to other people who may not be able, be able to experience it and do that for them in a way that they can, can do it um, expressing themselves in a scientific way. So what we did was we built a real world blood vessel uh, and an experience. Um, and at these conferences, patients were able to see what was happening in their own blood vessels. Uh, and it was medically accurate, uh, but they were able to walk through with headphones that actually kind of voice through what this experience was like. So if they were super innate uh, in terms of science and, and understood it, fantastic, it was a review. But if they didn't understand it, this was another way to provide education for them, their family, uh, and anyone else that was interested in understanding more. So really taking science and the disease to another level and letting people truly experience what it would be like to almost walk through your blood vessels in your body as a sickle cell patient. This was one of my favorite parts. So when we really talked about blowing up uh, the status quo, if you will, in terms of farm and how you connect with patients. One of the insights that we gathered was that patients in, in the African-American community or the black community, if you will, you know, one of the things that we, we, we quickly understood was it's about community and had the idea literally trying to think about what could we do to take people thinking about wanting to, 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 um, build a community sort of feel with, with sickle cell, but also what can we do to bring more light to this condition and really start to break down the walls? And what I thought about was bringing in celebrity um, DJs that could come in and really show a connection with this community. One, two, it would educate them as people who are not connected to this community at all and their followers in a way that also provided an opportunity for people with sickle cell to meet people that had, they had only seen on, on a TV screen or a movie screen, or had almost never thought that that person would care about them or their condition. So if you look, we had super relevant faces from today and perhaps from yesterday, maybe legends that uh, I certainly grew up admiring, but it was awesome to see all of these guys and, and gals come and really lend an arm and a leg and a hand and and um, and music, um, and for while we provided education around sickle cell, when you see big names like DJ Envy, the McCourtney twins, Biz Markey, um, Jordan Sparks, who was our, our spokesperson with sickle cell, MC Light, a legend from uh, New York City from the hip hop scene, Big Tigger, who is from Atlanta, Funk Master Flex, uh, and even Just Blaze, who I actually grew up with uh, in New Jersey, but all of these folks really came in super. Um, excited about learning, and they actually uh, benefited benefited the community by not only getting to engage with these patients on on the set, if you will, or on the spot in a live forum, but also taking that back to their communities and educating their followers, and in essence, allowing everyone in and out of the sickle cell community to benefit and understand what's truly happening in the lives of people who are living with this condition every day. <clears throat> 
So, traveling the country, the other DJs. We were back in the uh, the home office, uh, trying to uh, really get this campaign out there through digital channels. And one of the things Mike mentioned earlier about mobile, uh, we knew this was a mobile audience. What we didn't expect was at one point, we actually had 92% of the traffic going to our website uh, was from mobile devices. And we knew that people would most likely share their story, you know, would, would record it on a phone. So we wanted to make sure that that user experience was, was you know, natural. They could upload it right from their phone. And, and that did, you know, end up playing out well because we had so much traffic from mobile devices. We partnered with all the advocacy partners that were very much on board. We weren't seen as a pharma partner. We were seen as a as a you know very authentic partner in the disease space and i think that helped um really get them to amplify the message for us and then when it came to you know just digital media we were we we didn't leave a stone unturned right if we thought we could reach patients there we were going to try it if it worked we would invest more if it didn't we'd move on to something else and so you know as this was you know in a pre-launch phase it really helped us understand where you know where these patients are where where we can engage them the most where they're, they're having conversations um, with other patients, you know, where, so we were able to find out where we wanted to be um, to help them uh, learn more about disease and get, you know, become part of this, this program. So <clears throat> when we look at, you know, social media and, and just media in general, we had our own channels. We, we did um, build a, a, you know, a good Facebook following with Generation S, uh, which is still active today. You'll go on there, you'll see, you know, uh, we're constantly rolling out videos still and getting people engaged. We had our Novartis channels, and then we had paid channels. And, and Mike had mentioned, you know, Jordan Sparks. We had other, you know, celebrity influencers. We had media partners, companies like BlackDoctor.org that were very relevant to the audience out there, you know, promoting Generation S, getting people to to take action. And then we had a lot of earned media, which we expected but didn't realize, I think, the level that it came up to was we had people would share their story, but then they'd share the campaign. We had celebrities, you know, media companies, you know, bloggers, um, journalists sharing it organically because they just felt it was such a great, authentic pharma campaign. And our organic social actually um, was 50 percent higher than our paid social. And I don't think we've ever seen that somewhere. Uh, that's how well it performed and, and how much earned media we got out of this. And last thing I want to focus on uh, with numbers here is um, if you look at this, this chart here, we, we talked about some of the, the higher numbers before, the opt-ins and the stories, but we the initial start of this campaign was based on share your story. We're going to pick a couple of patients to meet with Jordan Sparks. Um, I know Mike didn't didn't touch on this, but Jordan Sparks had a had a, a family member uh, who who had passed away from sickle cell disease, so it was very personal to her, and it, it really she was a great advocate for this. And she's you know okay, I'm gonna you know meet with patients. So we did have this initial spike when she went out with us and did a media day. That campaign ended later that year. So Mike said we launched this in September. We had that media day around early November, and then you had till December to share your story. So we had that giant spike. After that, people continued to share their stories. We weren't, there was no incentive. There was no reason to share a story. But what we learned was that people just want to, they need to tell their story. And so that, that was probably one of the biggest learnings we got out of this that I think tr translates to a lot of therapeutic areas, right? If you give patients a platform, they're gonna take it. And we actually, even last year when we weren't really doing much with celebrities anymore, we're still share stories. We still create content for social. We still had people, we were probably getting half a dozen stories a month and uh, it was just amazing. For, you know, we weren't asking for them or driving people to do that. They just wanted to share their story. And so I think that that is one of the biggest takeaways from this. And we're going to wrap up uh, with a two minute video. And then I think that does leave us just a few minutes for questions. Um, I think, you know, if you, I see some comments about, you know, this being inspiring. Hopefully this video will um, will take that even a step further. Hello, my name is Elizabeth. My name is Kadeem. My name is Nike. My name is Rodney. My name is Michael. My name is Joseph. is so hard to live with and what can make it even harder is when people don't understand what you're going through or worse 
both here. Pain in my knees, and I gotta take it easy. Can't just do what I please. I can hop in the pool and then be dying to breathe. I got goals that I set out that I can never achieve. I mean, that's just what they say when they talk my disease, but I don't pay it no mind because this is a must I succeed. And as a kid, I heard the scariest thing you'll be dead by 21. I still hear that in my dreams. But me and God made the scariest team. Cause I'm 27 now, now tell me there ain't a king. I drink them fluids and they scare me now. Plus I'm too paid up to let it worry me now. Dr. Trippin' cause he thinking that I'm getting high. Pain management, that's just how I'm getting by. But it's never the case. These pills should be for comfort, never happen to chase. I'm in a battle with myself and I tell me that ain't a race. Hey guys, let me tell you, I am so impressed. That is a fantastic program on top of the fact that it's great to see both of you again. So I haven't seen either of you in so long. So nice to see you, but fantastic, fantastic program. Um, I think Seth posted a question, which I, I too was thinking like how, how much duplicating of this do you see? Is it scalable? Something that someone else could kind of grab and for me it was kind of the timeline you shared i see the timeline um my other thought was how do you prove it was successful and then we sh you guys showed the numbers and yeah I, I think if the engagement is let going on beyond the initial touch point then that is so telling right there that that community is in need of a, a platform and has used it which is fantastic so I am applauding you guys because I know how much that took for all those aspects to get approved <laughs> and through and and out there. So congratulations on that. Um, but do you think, do you see it as something that uh, like another brand could use or in terms of leveraging your learnings? Is it someplace someone could touch base with you? Because I think that's what people will probably want to know. Yeah, I mean, you know, Brad can, can, can um, certainly, uh, you know, validate this. I, I mean, I actually have transitioned out of the sickle cell space onto another role. And I cannot tell you how many times on a given month I have people in and out of Novartis who are reaching out to see if they can hear more, how do we do it because they want to do it. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it just speaks to when you listen to the people first, market research, all those things are important, but really what made Generation S so special was listening to the insights and really driving those insights. And to me, that's the magic. Generation S is, is a product of the insight generation and applying mm -hmm. those insights. So I don't think generation in and of itself is the, you know, the magic, if you will. What really made it magical was the patients themselves and us, you know, kind of perhaps taking out some, well, not perhaps, we threw our biases away and yeah. really were informed by the patient community and we we let them tell us what we need to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the things that helped help too is Mike came from a, from a small biotech and he came into big pharma and it, it was definitely a, a culture shock for him, but he also really, he, he pushed the envelope a lot and he broke a lot of people's comfort zones. And I, you know, I think that that was a big, um, big player in all this. And now that he's on a new brand, I still work with them, so I'm just a matter of time before <laughs> something else is coming. Out. That's good. I like it. it. I like it. But that's it. I think. I think we all know how much. That's a lot of things that got out in the market at one time, and tangible things, and things that let a patient use their own voice. And I think all of those are. I think at one time we all talk about it, and then we let this no sort of like lay on us and move us in a different direction. And I like the fact that that did not happen. So that's awesome. <laughs> 
I mean, if I could just add to that one video that you guys saw, that that gentleman there named Blaze, that video was just a submission. That was his actual yeah. Generation S submission. And the first time I saw it, I was like, wow. And you heard a quote in there. I want you guys just to think about the impact of what this quote means. He was told as a kid, he died by the age of 21. Oh, wow. So that, and that's not uncommon within sickle cell. We hear people say, I was told by seven, by 15, by age 13, by 18. And I've known people in, um, in this community that I've worked with over the last recent months that are no longer here because they actually have passed away. But when you think about that and the sense of community and what Generation S was able to do, when people see um, these videos or they see their stories or they see a pamphlet and they see people that they know, this has truly happened, where people pick it up and say, hey, I wanna show this to this person who's in the next room. I want them to see their faces on this. Mm. It, really, it, it really made patients take over the campaign. They drove Generation S, we didn't. Wow. It's amazing. That's, and that's everything that you could hope for, but more so for the patient than anybody else. So that's really awesome. Yeah, that's fantastic. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys. Um, I think we're going to, oh my God, I have, Seth will kill me. <laughs> I'm going to have to, oh, we're jumping out. So if Seth hops on, I think we're jumping out to um, a happy hour. And I was going to say that I didn't see any other questions, but if people have questions, find these two at the, um, breakout sessions and ask them questions on how to make it a possibility for how to, and even just how to get some yeses, because you clearly got some yeses <laughs> across from uh, getting stuff done. So I think find them in the offline or in the networking section. So thank you guys for your time.